want to delete something. There it goes. Later on, I found out that that wasn't correct. Right, that's, that's not exactly really the reason why I married my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, uh, welcome everybody to our uh, conversation today with Ambassador Moriarty. Welcome to the Tower Center and welcome to our uh, program on security and strategy. Uh, I'm Josh Rovner. For those of you who I, I don't know, I'm the director here this year. I'm also the Tower Chair of National Security and International Politics. Thank you so much for braving the great deluge. Uh, the, I, I think it's exactly five months to the day to our last great deluge. I'm glad, I'm glad you made, made it. Um, it'll be worth your while, I'm sure. Uh, I won't say any more except to say uh, you have in front of you um, a couple of upcoming Tower Center events. If you're ish interested in issues related to international affairs and national security, security uh, I'll just point out one in particular on November 5th. We're having a, a, an event on the rise of ISIS uh, featuring Joby Warwick, the Washington Post, and Caitlin Talmadge, who's a professor at George Washington. And one week later, not on your card, November 12th, we're having our annual national security dinner featuring uh, General Craig McKinley, who was chief of the National Guard Bureau and a member of the Joint Chiefs staff. So that's November 12th. All of this information is on the Tower Center website. And if you're not on our mailing list, please let us know, and we will uh, get you signed up. With that, it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Lai Yi Liang. Thanks, Josh. I'm Lai Yi Liang. I'm a fellow here at the Tower Center and also a fellow at the Center for <coughs> Presidential History. Today, I'm pleased to introduce a rare individual, someone who can speak extensively and knowledgeably about two regions that usually attract specialists who may know something about one area but not the other. Yet yeah, they're both crucial to U.S. foreign policy and now more than ever critical to the global balance of power, both political and economic. I'm referring to East Asia and South Asia, each the home of the most populist, um, populated countries in the world, China and India. Ambassador James Moriarty is that notable expert whose career has given him an exceptional inside look into these two regions. As a diplomat, Ambassador Moriarty worked in senior level positions in China and Taiwan in the late 80s and 90s. He was a natural choice when George W. Bush became president and sought an NSC director for China affairs. This was a crucial time given China's re-emergence into the world stage. Shortly after, Ambassador Moriarty was appointed special advisor to the president and the NSC senior director for East Asia, South Asia, and the Pacific. That meant he guided presidential policy towards what was, what, what was and is by far the world's most populous regions and also the most economically dynamic and the most diverse. In 2004, Ambassador Moriarty returned to the State Department and became the U.S. Ambassador to first Nepal and then Bangladesh. He retired from public service in 2011 and has since worked for a D.C.-based consultancy firm he provides advice on Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. He speaks Chinese Mandarin, Urdu, Nepali, and Bangla, and I can attest he also speaks some English. <laughs> <laughs> so the ambassador is well placed today to talk to us about Pakistan. The title of the lecture is Pakistan, Terrorists, Nukes, and Betrayal, but gotta get it right. Getting it right with Pakistan, that sounds like a tall order. But if anyone is going to be able to tell us, it's Ambassador Moriarty. <laughs> Ambassador, please. Thank you. Thank you for that very gracious introduction. And I'm reminded that you know I, I have a strange accent in every language, including English. So if people down here in Texas have a tough time understanding what I'm saying with my Massachusetts, what I call dumb Pollock accent, please raise your hand and let me know. Uh, and we're going to start off in another language. Aloha. Aloha. That's right. Okay, you got it. Uh, I'm delighted to be here at the Tower Center today to talk about something that's been very important in my life. I appreciate the chance to enjoy warm Texas hospitality and cold Texas rain <laughs> while talking about that issue. Pakistan. To start off, I'm going to test whether a good meal and the soft pitter-patter of raindrops has made you all a little bit sleepy. I'm going to ask you three questions. First, what country has, since 9-11, suffered nearly 60,000 deaths in its struggle against terrorism? More than five times the deaths the U.S. has suffered, count, suffered counting both the, the wars since then. Second, 
What country is projected to have 350 nuclear warheads within the decade? The third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. And finally, what country considers itself a close ally of long standing of the United States, but also feels that the U.S. has left it in the lurch repeatedly and is preparing to abandon it again? All those who answered Pakistan are correct and have come to the right lunch. Uh, all those who didn't, we'll see if we can get you to that point. <clears throat> I lived in Pakistan for three years, spoke pretty good Urdu at the time, traveled around the entire country, and made a lot of good Pakistani friends. I've worked on issues related to Pakistan off and on for about 30 years now. The country is not only important, but also far more complex than it might appear to be in the little coverage that it gets in the Western media. Today I'm going to focus on three issues introduced by the questions I just asked. Terrorism, nuclear weapons, and feelings of mutual betrayal between the United States and Pakistan. But I'm also going to talk about Pakistan's place in the world today and why Pakistan is important to the United States. And I'll offer some personal views on how the United States could get its Pakistan policy as right as possible. And since I'm no longer in the government, I will not be held responsible for that. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's start with Pakistan itself. Pakistan has a population of about 200 million people, about two-thirds the population of the United States, and that's squeezed into an area twice the size of California. 97% of Pakistan's people's people are Muslims, but they are Muslims of various sects, not only Sunni sects, but also about 15% Shia. From the perspective of U.S. foreign policy, and I wish I had brought a map here, Pakistan has four of the most interesting neighbors imaginable, India, China, Afghanistan, and Iran. I first landed in Pakistan in June 1984. As my wife, my five-month-old son, and I drove from the airport to our new home in Islamabad, the 114-degree heat shimmered off the parched pre-monsoon countryside. Hyenas woke us up in the middle of that first night. We had arrived in a country of dramatic physical beauty and fascinating and diverse cultures, and with a history of conflict that stretched from the time of Alexander the Great to the Mughal Conquest to the late 19th century when European colonial powers vied for control in the high Hindu Kush to Pakistan's bloody post-World World War, excuse me, post -World War II partition from India to the war in 1972 that led to in East Pakistan breaking off to become Bangladesh. As we arrived in 1984, Pakistan was again in conflict. A, con a frontline state and the linchpin in U.S. efforts to evict the Soviets from Afghanistan. <clears throat> and since 9-11, Pakistan has actively fought terrorists and provided crucial logistical support for allied forces in Afghanistan. The United States and Pakistan were treaty allies from 1954 to 1973 and have been close partners in the global war on terrorism. At the same time, however, Pakistan has frequently looked to the United States like an unreliable partner. Pakistan has sought to deceive the United States on issues ranging from Pakistani government support for terrorist groups to development of nuclear weapons. Pakistan appears to be pursuing policies on very important issues such as Afghanistan that are sharply at odds with U.S. interests. Moreover, despite the U.S. having provided Pakistan some $30 billion dollars in civilian and military aid since 2002, the Pakistani intelligence services encourage Pakistan's media to, to spew out viciously anti-American propaganda. Partly as a result, polls show that only 14% of Pakistanis view the United States favorably. How did we get to this state? For Pakistan, terrorism is both a threat to the nation and a tool of the state. Pakistan's chief of army staff has declared terrorism the single greatest security threat to Pakistan. At the same time, Pakistan's military intelligence service 
the inter the Inter Services Intelligence Directorate, affectionately known as ISI. It continues to support and direct terrorist groups. Since the creation of Pakistan in 1947, Pakistani governments have used terrorism to pursue their goals in the region. A little background as to why. At the insistence of Muslim politicians, the British divided British India at the time of independence into predominantly Hindu and predominantly Muslim portions. The rulers of the Muslim portion, the new nation of Pakistan, found themselves running a much poorer and weaker nation than India. The newly created Pakistan had six main ethnic groups and languages <coughs> and two halves divided by 1,000 miles of Indian territory. Although many of the political and military elite in Pakistan at the time were hard-drinking secularists, they decided that Islam and the threat that India might try to reabsorb Pakistan were the most effective tools at hand to try and create a national identity out of this hodgepodge. Official Pakistani paranoia about India led to the creation of a Pakistani state where the military became the dominant institution. Pakistan's military has controlled the government not only during 27 years of direct military rule, but even under elected civilian regimes. From the beginning, the military rulers of Pakistan found fundamentalist Islamic groups to be useful, not only in promoting Islam as the cement binding the nation together, but also in fighting the state's internal and external enemies. Through the years, Pakistan has used terrorist groups both to establish, to try to establish pro-government, pro-Pakistan governments in Afghanistan and also to destabilize India. In the end, however, this support for terrorism and terrorist groups has come back to haunt Pakistan. The number of terrorist groups inside Pakistan exploded, including some only marginally under the control of the Pakistani government and others, such as the Pakistani Taliban, actively trying to overthrow the state. <clears throat> now the Pakistan military finds itself in the uncomfortable situation of supporting terrorist groups that are causing chaos in Afghanistan and attacking India while fighting other terrorist groups attempting to establish their rule inside Pakistan. Reportedly, the Islamic State is also attempting to woo individuals from terrorist groups inside Pakistan to help establish that caliphate stretching from the Mediterranean to Burma. The security threat has also led to deferred investment, delayed economic development, and an exodus from the country of some of Pakistan's best and brightest. Pakistan's military has responded to this growing threat. In late 2014, terrorists attacked a military-run school in Peshawar. That attack left 145 dead, including 132 young boys. In response, the Pakistani government stepped up its offensive against terrorist groups dedicated to overthrowing the state. This, gov this government offensive has had an impact. Deaths from terrorism have declined 50% as of October 1st compared to the same period last year. But that still means that as of October 1st, the struggle against terrorism had cost more than 3,000 Pakistani lives this year slightly more than the total number who died in the U.S. on 9-11. Let's turn to Pakistan's nuclear weapons. Pakistan sees nuclear weapons in the context of India. In 1972, after it became clear that India was working on a nuclear explosive device, Pakistan began, began its own secret quest for a nuclear weapon. During the 1980s, while Pakistan provided critical support to the U.S. effort to throw the Soviets out of Afghanistan, Washington followed closely intelligence reports about progress in Pakistan's nuclear weapon program. In 1990, the year after the Soviets finished withdrawing from Afghanistan, the U.S. declared that Pakistan possessed a nuclear weapon. Under U.S. law, that finding forced the United States to cut off U.S. assistance to Pakistan. Eight years later, after the Indians tested a nuclear weapon, Pakistan conducted its first test of a nuke. Since then, Pakistan has poured resources into its nuclear program 
It has the world's fastest growing nuclear arsenal with some 120 nuclear weapons deployed to date. Across the border sits India with perhaps 100 nuclear weapons deployed. The two countries have fought four wars, each of which ended in a stalemate or a victory for India. <coughs> Against that backdrop, Pakistan's military continues to hype India as an existential threat to Pakistan and has come to view a nuclear deterrent as essential to Pakistan's survival, allowing it to balance India's superiority in conventional weapons. In contrast to Pakistan, however, the, the United States views a nuclear arms race in South Asia as destabilizing and potentially disastrous. In 2002, I was serving in the National Security Council as President uh, Bush, George W. Bush's Special Assistant for Asia. I spent much of the first half of that year supporting U.S. diplomatic efforts to ensure that rapidly rising tensions between Pakistan and India did not lead to yet another war. Based on our information at the time, we genuinely feared that a war between the two could have led to a nuclear exchange that would have killed hundreds of millions of people. The two sides did not go to war, but the crisis reminded the U.S. of how precarious the nuclear balance in South Asia can be. The U.S. has two additional concerns about Pakistan's nuclear weapons program. First, the possibility that Pakistan might provide nuclear weapon technology and expertise to other states. And secondly, the possibility that terrorists might somehow obtain one or more nuclear weapons from Pakistan's arsenal. The Pakistani military assures us and the outside world that it is aware of this danger <laughs> and has implemented the strictest possible controls to prevent outsiders from getting control of one of their nuclear weapons. The U.S. does indeed believe that Pakistan has instituted strict controls, but has no way of knowing whether those controls will prove 100% effective. In addition, there is a proven record of proliferation of Pakistani nuclear weapons technology to other countries. In the 1980s and 90s, the so-called father of Pakistan's nuclear bomb, Dr. A.Q. Khan, set up an elab elaborate network containing over 30 companies that supplied technology and materials to three nations trying to build nuclear weapons, Iran, Libya, and North Korea. When Dr. Khan's activities were discovered, the Pakistani government put him under detention and denied any involvement with or knowledge of his proliferation network. <coughs> Five years later, the Pakistani courts released Dr. Khan. Especially with the current turmoil in the Middle East, the United States will be watching closely to ensure that there is no further proliferation of Pakistan's nuclear weapons technology. U.S.-Pakistani differences on nuclear issues and terrorism fall under a larger cloud of suspicion, mutual suspicion, and a history of perceived betrayals. Pakistani governments, and particularly the Pakistani military, have traditionally viewed the U.S. as an indispensable but fickle partner. The Pakistani military believed it needed weapons and diplomatic backing from the United States to counter the threat from India. Civilian authorities sought U.S. assistance for economic development in Pakistan, a low middle income country with average per capita GDP of around $4,000 per year, an average life expectancy of just over 65 years. On repeated occasions, however, the United States has put on hold much of its relationship with Pakistan, including the part most valued by the Pakistan military, the provision of high-tech U.S. weapons. The Pakistani military and public view these actions as betrayals by the United States. Among U.S. officials and media, repeated Pakistani attempts at deception, particularly with respect to terrorism and nuclear weapons, have created an almost knee-jerk cynicism and distrust of any pronouncements by or activities of the Pakistani government. Now, respected U.S. academics, journalists, and former government officials have once again begun calling for a drastic reduction in the U.S. relationship with Pakistan. The real problem between Pakistan and the United States is that the two sides have always wanted very different things out of the relationship. The U.S. has wanted Pakistan to be a reliable partner, 
first in containing the Soviet Union, and then in the war against terrorism. Pakistan has also wanted the United States to be a, a reliable partner, but has defined that as providing the weapons and diplomatic backing necessary for Pakistan to be able to stand up to India. Pakistan worked hard and suffered considerably to help evict the Soviets out of Afghanistan. But it did so primarily for its own strategic reasons, focused on installing a friendly regime in Kabul, as it had been trying to do even before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. After 9-11, Pakistan felt compelled to support U.S. attempts to change the Taliban regime that Islamabad had helped create in Afghanistan. And eventually, the Pakistani military had to begin fighting head-on the terrorist groups inside Pakistan trying to overthrow the state. But the Pakistani military has displayed no, th no enthusiasm to date for going after terrorist groups within Pakistan's borders that limit their attacks to India and Afghanistan. The United States has throughout the years provided considerable economic and military assistance to Pakistan, particularly when the two countries have faced a common threat. When that common threat has waned, however, the U.S. has focused on Pakistan's shortcomings and acted accordingly, such as by calling for greater democracy or suspending assistance. Just as important, however, the United States has grown closer and closer to India. Last month, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited the United States. This week, Pakistan's Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is visiting. Prime Minister Sharif met yesterday with President Obama. The Pakistani Prime Minister is coming at a time when the strategic environment in South and Southwest Asia is changing dramatically in ways that will inevitably affect Pakistan's relationship with the U.S. The most urgent question in the neighborhood will be the evolution of Afghanistan, the issue on which Pakistani and U.S. objectives vary most dramatically. For the United States, stability in Afghanistan is critical. In contrast, the Pakistani military sees as a vital national interest the establishment of a regime in Afghanistan that is friendly to Pakistan. For Pakistan, having an Afghan government with friendly ties to New Delhi would amount to encirclement by the enemy and would deny Pakistanis any strategic depth in the event of another war with India. The Pakistani military believes the best way to ensure a friendly government in Kabul is to make sure that the Afghan Taliban play an important role in that government. For now, Pakistan is willing to seek that end primarily by brokering and influencing negotiations. But Pakistan already provides sanctuary for the Afghan Taliban and in the future would likely provide logistical and tactical support to the Taliban if an all-out civil war developed. China's rise will also have a big impact on Pakistan and its relationship with the U.S. Pakistan has always viewed China as an all-weather friend. Through storms, through sunshine, the view is that China has always stood by Pakistan. They, China could be depended on through thick and thin. Until recently, however, Pakistan has not viewed China as rich enough or willing enough to supplant the U.S. in providing weapons, economic assistance, and diplomatic support to Pakistan. <clears throat> Pakistan's views on that appear to be changing. This April, uh, President Xi Jinping announced plans for a $46 billion China-Pakistan economic corridor. The bulk of the money, which would come from commercial Chinese investments and loans, would go towards doubling Pakistan's electrical production. Most of the rest would be spent on rail, roads, railroads, and pipelines, tying the port of Gwador in Balochistan in southwestern Pakistan to infrastructure in western China, 2,000 miles away across barren deserts and mountains over 15,000 feet high. China has also been stepping up defense cooperation with Pakistan. Since 2007, Pakistan have, and China have co-produced a fighter jet. Earlier this year, Pakistan announced that it would buy from China eight advanced diesel-electric submarines worth perhaps four to five billion dollars. Despite the in intensifying Sino-Pak relationship, 
China will likely be as comfortable as the U.S. with Pakistani efforts to destabilize <coughs> Afghanistan or to nurture specific terrorist groups. On both terrorism and Afghanistan, Beijing and Washington see eye to eye. Both want President Ashraf Ghani's government to establish effective control and stability over Afghanistan, and both the United States and China fear Afghanistan or Pakistan-based terrorist groups could attack their homelands. Another major change affecting Pakistan and the U.S. is the rise of China and the simultaneous improvement of U.S. Excuse me, is the rise of India and the simultaneous improvement of U.S. relations with that country. For the U.S., India's rise is pretty much all to the good. India has become a main factor in the U.S. rebalance to Asia. Ties between the United States and India in areas from defense to trade to people-to-people -people exchanges have advanced faster than anyone could have imagined a decade ago. Over that period, the U.S. has also decoupled its relationship with India from the U.S. relationship with Pakistan. Okay, what that means in plain English is the U.S. does what it wants with India without worrying about Pakistan's reaction to any specific move. This takes away one of the key benefits Islamabad had sought to gain from its relationship with Washington, the U.S. willingness to intervene with India on Pakistan's behalf. For Pakistan, the rise of India, particularly its quickly growing economy, could potentially provide major benefits. Unfortunately, Pakistan's military, in order to justify its huge share of the national budget, its special privileges within society and its control over the politics and foreign policy of the nation continues to portray India as the existential threat to the security of Pakistan. Okay, up to now, I've painted a pretty dark portrait of Pakistan. Okay, I realize that I might sound as though I support those who argue that the U.S. needs to disengage from Pakistan, give it up as a lost cause. That is not at all what I believe. I believe that Pakistan is a country in flux with which the United States must remain engaged. Today's Pakistan represents continuity with and the logical outcome of policies and ide ideologies adopted soon after the country's birth. The military continues to dominate the politics of the country continues to de define India as a real and immediate threat to the nation in order to justify that domination of the politics and foreign policy, and continues to use Islam as a crutch to unify the nation, rather than allow democratic institutions the space to build a national identity. Most Pak Pakistani people view Pakistan's civilian politicians and governments as corrupt and incompetent and accept the military as a stabilizing, indeed, maybe the only stabilizing institution in the country. But perhaps the system I've just described has come to the end of its shelf life. To put it bluntly, if the problem is India, then Pakistan has no solution, except to find a way to live with the regional superpower next door. Pakistan has neither the wealth nor the international standing to compete peacefully with India and would be crushed in a conventional war or obliterated in a nuclear exchange. If Islam is the only tool to unify in the nation, Pakistan will face a splintered future where different sects of Islam fight over theology while killing both each other and the nation's minorities. If terrorism is the only tool to project Pakistan's influence in its neighborhood, then Pakistan must prepare for a future where the international community views it with disdain and where terrorist groups outside the government's control ravage the nation and try to overthrow the state. More important, Pakistan is changing. Although the military still harasses and intimidates the media on certain issues, newspapers, television channels, and websites are exploding in their numbers and reach and provide a wealth of views and op opinions on most issues. <laughs> 140 million Pakistanis now have cell phones, 
meaning information flows instantly and constantly around the country. The majority of Pakistan's now agree, excuse me, the majority of Pakistanis now agree terrorism represents a serious threat to the country. And most Pakistanis realize that India is outstripping their country in creating wealth and earning respect of the international community. One indicator of these changes, Malala Yousafzai, the brave 17-year-old girl who won a Nobel Peace Prize for standing up to the Taliban, inspired two million Pakistanis to sign a, pe to sign a petition that forced the passing of legislation guaranteeing girls the right to education. And if Pakistan is changing and has the potential to become a more open democratic country, then the United States needs to do what it can to influence that change in a positive direction. History has taught us that U.S. disengagement from Pakistan leads to disastrous results. While the United States was disengaged in the 1990s, Pakistan helped create the Taliban and install it as the government in Afghanistan, fostered and supplied anti-Indian terrorist groups, almost fought a war with India over a glacier high up in the Himalayas, and saw its military become an increasingly fundamentalist and anti-U.S. organization. That history must <coughs> not repeat itself. We cannot afford that. So what's the answer? Well, the U.S. must continue to work with Pakistan not only on regional matters of immediate concern, such as the resupply of coalition and force, forces in Afghanistan and brokering a genuine peace there, but also on longer-term problems confronting Pakistan itself, such as girls' education. Our two countries can also work together on other issues of global importance, as, for example, we have on peacekeeping and eradication of polio. The U.S. must treat the democratic institutions of Pakistan with respect. For example, by according civilian political leaders the access and dignified treatment accorded the generals who have run the country. The U.S. can reevaluate, but must not cut entirely its ties with the Pakistan military. Under almost any scenario, the military will cont continue to play a major role in the politics and foreign policy of Pakistan. Instead of cutting off such a powerful institution, the U.S. needs to focus on the frequently frustrating long-term process of building ties with and trying to influence the organization, including by continuing training the Pakistani military in topics that some people consider sensitive, such as counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. Given the growth in Chinese arms sales to Pakistan, maybe the U.S. can lessen its activity in that area. But ultimately, only by developing closer ties with the Pakistan military can we hope to influence its direction. <clears throat> and finally, the U.S. must find more effective ways to push back against the vis vicious and inaccurate anti-U.S. propaganda contained in much of Pakistan's media. In sum, <clears throat> though it might be difficult, the U.S. has a chance in the coming years to help nuclear, a nuclear-armed Pakistan become a force for stability in an extremely volatile region. Our only hope of doing so is to remain engaged with this fascinating and rapidly changing country. Thank you. I will take any questions you have on this or China or in Indonesia, where I just lived for a year. But anyhow. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to moderate um, this, this session, so thank you, Ambassador. Uh, if I may ask the first question and then I'll open it up. Uh, you know, you talk about the importance of um, strengthening ties with the Pakistani military, but are there credible civilian uh, leaders uh, that the U.S. can also work with who could offer a counterpoint to the military? That's, that's what I meant when I said that uh, we need to treat the democratic institutions with respect. The bad thing is that the Pakistani military so obviously calls the shots in so many areas of importance to us that traditionally we have tended to treat the military leaders with greater seriousness than we do the, the, the civilian leaders. And so, yes, you know, we, we do have to treat the prime minister as the leader of the country, uh, even if we understand that his powers are circumscribed. 
uh, we do have to reach out to the governors and the chief ministers in the provinces. And I don't want to say we haven't done that. When I was in Pakistan, which was a much more open environment, we did have close relations. I mean, I could, uh, I could have one of my locals get half of the Pakistani cabinet over for a dinner, and, and we, could, we could meet and talk over issues with them and talk over politics. Uh, it's harder now because of the security uh, concerns, but it is still something that we have to do in country and also out of country. Uh, when these guys travel, we do have to treat them with respect. We have to begin telling the Pakistani people that these guys are treated uh, with, as having as much stature of the, as the military. Thank you. Um, I think the gentleman at the end of the table first. Yeah, that was going to be my question. The other one I have is, <clears throat> what are the uh, natural resources of Pakistan? Not that great. Uh, there, there's some oil, some gas, mm -hmm. but probably not enough, even with good development, to feed the country itself. Uh, it is, it, it is a, it does produce a lot of the cotton in the world, uh, but it's mainly an agricultural country that needs to industrialize and is industrializing. One of the big questions is, you know, how free access do we, we grant the Pakistani textile industry into the United States? Because uh, that is a place where they would. They do have a toehold and would like to expand rapidly, and of course that gets involved in U.S. trade politics. Um, I'm interested in your comments about Osama bin Laden and the fact that it's been alleged, I don't know whether it's ever been proven, that the uh, Pakistani military knew about his uh, presence there. And in fact, he was right next to one of the major military uh, basis there. Could you comment on that and also comment on the fact that uh, it's my understanding that the distrust was so great between our government and Pakistan's government that we did not tell them at all about the raid and went in there, violated their airspace, all that kind of stuff, and, and they tried to respond. They didn't respond at the time, but I'd be inter interested in your whole assessment of that. Stuff. Well, yeah, I, I think there's an article out in the New Yorker or something that's kind of uh, raising some of the issues about whether there was a big conspiracy where the, uh, we had put, told the Pakistanis ahead of time and they had cleared out their people in the area. Uh, I tend to believe in Occam's razor, which is the simplest explanation is usually the correct one, and that yes, indeed, we could fly stealth helicopters into Abbottabad without the Pakistani military finding out about it. Uh, that we could get them in and out fast enough in the middle of the night without the Pakistani military being <coughs> able to effectively react. The Pakistani military treated this as a huge embarrassment. And indeed, that's, uh, if not one of the betrayals, it's one of the sources of, of continuing friction. Uh, and I tend to believe the simplest answer, which is no, we did not tell them ahead of time because we did fear that word would leak. As to whether the Pakistani government knew uh, <coughs> that Osama bin Laden was hiding two miles from the Pakistani National Military Academy in a cantonment city with lots of other military units in it. Uh, it depends on what you mean. Pro it probably depends. I don't know for a fact anything, but it probably depends on what you mean by the Pakistani government. Uh, did the civilian government of the day know? Almost oh, certainly not. Uh, did the chief of army staff know? I don't know. I don't know. ISI is a very powerful institution that uh, has directorates that work in their own ways and don't share information too broadly. So, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Rachel? <clears throat> so one of the things that you mentioned, right, was um, the improved relationship with India, right, and how this is impacting relationships with Pakistan. And obviously, the U.S. government is decoupling these, um, but uh, you know, of course, we know that they're closely related. But something you didn't really touch on was that yes, it, relations are improving, but it's with the Modi government, right? Um, so. 
which of course has a lot of um, has has had a lot of anti-Islamic tendencies over the past year uh, and much longer, of course, uh, which have been disturbing. So, is the U.S. relationship with the Modi government going to exacerbate uh, the problem? I mean, just given the Hindu nationalist nature of that government, uh, it might to some degree. But the really uh, the more important question is. Uh, this improvement of the relationship is not something that's come overnight or with the start of the Modi government. Mm -hmm. It's been something that's been gradually going on since after the nuclear threat in 2002. Mm -hmm. You know, we decided that we had to find a way to shift the, to first decouple the relationship and to shift the relationship with India into a higher gear. That led to a nuclear agreement in 2005 and constant talks about how we move the relationship forward in various areas. What's happened is the Modi government is a much more effective government. Uh, and it's not as split by concerns over coalition politics as Manmohan Singh's, was, Manmohan Singh's was. It doesn't have a figure like Sonia Gandhi uh, outside the government being more important than the prime minister. Uh, Modi is in charge. He has a view. Eventually, the bureaucracy really has to try and influence it. For the first you know, eight or ten years of our attempts to build a stronger relationship with India, that wasn't the case. You know, we were dealing with Indian governments that were mired down in coalition politics that had, you know, by and large, bought into a better relationship with the U.S., <coughs> but would let the let the bureaucracy and the uh, smaller coalition partners put brakes on some of these attempts for a number of reasons, usually having to, on the part of the party, some of them <coughs> ideological, on the part of the bureaucracies. I'm going to tell you, sister <coughs> here, bureaucracies like to do what they've always done. They don't like to do what they, they haven't done before. So, yeah, that might, the Modi government in general might be an issue. Don't forget, though, Modi tried to reach out to Pakistan immediately after coming into power. And he had a good meeting with Nawaz Sharif, and then quickly everything got rolled back uh, once Nawaz Sharif got back to Pakistan. So uh, it took Modi pretty quickly to decide that, uh, yes, indeed, you know, the Pakistan military doesn't want to see that much relationship, excuse me, not that much progress in the bilateral relationship. And he has shifted his attention away uh, to a large degree. Lynn? I wanted to have you uh, discuss a bit more the relationship and the lack of relationship between the military, the traditional military, the army, and the ISI. Because well, it seems to me that the ISI is really what we need to worry about more well, than anything else, and you can't trust them. Well, uh, <laughs> ultimately, ISI is a tool of the military, and so it really does get back to the founding ideology that I was talking about, which to this day depends on the large, to a large degree, on painting India as the enemy. And don't forget, this is a military <coughs> that's come out on the bad end of four wars with, uh, with India. Uh, so that comes naturally. Just as importantly, uh, the educational system has adopted curricula pointing India, painting India and Hindus in general as the enemy of the state. Uh, the media, as I said, is very closely guided on what it can and cannot say about India. Uh, basically, the first being negative, the latter being positive. You know, you can't say anything too positive about India. Uh, you know, there are spells when, you know, Pakistanis really feel like, hey, you know, we need to have a better relationship. India is a huge market. Uh, we do have this common history, in many ways common culture. Uh, it just makes sense. And at certain periods you'll see a little bit of that, and then for whatever reason it will blow back. It will blow back either because the military has some specific concerns or they have a gen general concern coming forward. So really the question is, you know, not is the ISI uh, pursuing ends different from the government's. The question is, does the government really know what, it's doing, what the ISI is doing at all points? Because ultimately, I think the ISI genuinely believes that what it's doing is in Pakistan's best interests and, and in the interest of the Pakistan military. 
isn't it true that, that, that I mean, is, it, is it true that Afghanistan then is really a proxy between uh, Pakistan and India, with them trying to resist the Indian influence in Pakistan? Uh, to some degree, yes. Yeah, to, to some degree, you know, what really worried India, excuse me, what really worried Pakistan is that very quickly under Karzai, uh, the Indians set up consulates all around the country, and the Pakistanis assumed that these would all be staffed by intelligence officers, uh, and that they could be used as sort of jumping off points for terrorist attacks into Pakistan by uh, pro-Indian groups. Uh, that really worried them, but like I said, you know, even as early as the mid-70s, Pakistan was trying to establish, you establish a pro-Pakistan regime in Afghanistan, uh, mostly because of Afghanistan, because of India's interest in Afghanistan. There's also a question of what they call strategic depth. You know, it's not just having a, trying to win Afghanistan away, it's trying to win Afghanistan away because it borders on you, it's, and you're right between it and India. And also, frankly, if you have a friendly Afghanistan, you have more depth to retreat into uh, if, if there actually is a conventional attack from India. So it's complicated, but yeah, it's, it's primarily India-driven. Um, could you explain to us the way I mean, the, the uh, uh, because engagement costs money? So in what form and how much uh, we are supporting Afghanistan on the, you know, the, the scheme of pivot to Asia. And the reason I'm asking this is that um, you just also mentioned that China is supporting Pakistan and, and building stuff and their initiative is oftentimes uh, sending private companies in and therefore they can make profit out of it as well. And I'd like to share a story with you and also with the rest of the, the, the people here. I asked a question of uh, an Ambassador Crocker, you know, I've seen that um, United States being a Catholic society, uh, our international relations is always about human rights, democracy, and terrorism. And China being a communist society is always going to make a buck. And his response was <laughs> that um, during that major earthquake and the United States airlift um, support, uh, the re relief product, and it was very popular. And nearly in stores, they have uh, helicopters. Of toy helicopters, and if you flip it over, it says made in China. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm just wondering the, the in terms of the format of, of our support to Pakistan and the and the, and the proportion of our overall um, support to Asia. Uh, it's interesting enough if you read what they say about the rebalance, what the good U.S. government says about the rebalance to Asia. If you read it closely. It seems to stop at the India-Pakistan border. Uh, Pakistan has been treated as a special case. As, as I said earlier, it's gotten massive amounts of assistance uh, since the war on terrorism began, $30 billion, which is a, a huge amount. Uh, total amount? Total amount, civilian and military. And I think it's still predominantly military in terms of how you split that up. So you look at that and say, well, how do we do it? China is different from the U.S. in the sense that the government has much closer co cooperation with the big state owned enterprises. They'll go pretty much wherever China tells them to go. GE will not go where the U.S. government tells it to go. Uh, if GE thinks its employees are going to be killed in a certain country, they're going to be very reluctant to go there no matter what the U.S. government says, unless they can make a lot of money. This gets into a very interesting overlap. I, I think you, if you listen to me very closely when I described the China-Pakistan economic corridor, I was describing precisely what you said, that they planned on commercial companies investing in the country and loans to come up with this $46 billion. Well, China's going to run into the same issues that the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank have run into before, and that the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank will run into, which is, okay, it's one thing to have money to lend, uh, but if you have no hope of getting back that money, it's not a lend loan, it's a grant, and that draws down your resources pretty quickly. Uh, 
it's all good to get commercial people to invest, but they got to make money, or else that adds to the drain on the company's coffers. In the case of China's state-owned enterprises, since we all consider that sovereign debt, uh, it's a drain on the nation's wealth. And so I'm actually trying to raise the question as to whether anybody <coughs> thinks that on commercial terms you can, particularly with respect to the infrastructure, you can build roads, railroads, and pipelines that, call, that cross deserts where there's an active insurgency going on, uh, crossing through hills where you have lots of terrorists floating around, and then climbing up over 15,000 feet into the very high, high mountains. Have you ever driven the Karakoram Pass? It is one of the most amazing <coughs> roads in the world. This is the road between western China and Pakistan. It crosses at uh, 15,400 <coughs> feet or something like that. It's we're literally the top of the world. On the Chinese side, it's actually fairly gradual. You, 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 you don't notice the rise that much. On the Pakistani side, it drops something like 6,000 feet in 10 miles. Mm. Uh, and I'm thinking, okay, how much money is that going to cost? What kind of economic return are you going to get on it? How are you going to make sure that insurgents operating in largely empty territory don't cut the road, the railroad, and the pipeline with regularity. Uh, as I said, much of the commercial investment is supposed to go into energy. Well, you know, that's fine. But frankly, there'd be lots of commercial investment in Pakistan's energy sector if the government just gets policies a lot better. And they have to get them a lot better. I mean, uh, you already have not only Chinese, but British and American companies complaining that attempts at building solar parks are running into crazy alterations in the rules of the game, specifically with respect to the amount that uh, they can get paid for the energy they produce uh, on the part of the uh, Pakistani authorities. So it's, you know, yeah, I, I, I agree. Ideally, I think the U.S. government and much of U.S. policy <coughs> is geared towards encouraging countries to build the economic environment that attracts investment, but unless the economic environment is there, U.S. companies won't, won't go in. And that economic environment also has to include the security environment. You know, there, there are a reasonable number of American companies looking at Pakistan, but they just get the willies. You know, it's just a little too uncertain for them. On the other hand, interesting factoid, I love factoids, there are more KFCs in Pakistan right now than there are in all of Africa. <laughs> and it's actually a big number. It's like two or three hundred KFCs in Pakistan. <laughs> for all the security costs, the United States support for security. I don't have a figure. The we were giving two different things. Uh, a big thing what we were giving was coalition support funds, allowing us to use Pakistani territory to resupply. Afghanistan to pay the cost of that and to support Pakistan in its own uh, counterterrorism efforts. And that at its peak was three or four billion dollars a year. It's been like a billion dollars this year and the question is of course, well, you know, we assumed we'd have been out of there so this was supposed to be the last year at about a billion dollars. Uh, it'll probably get extended another year is my guess or maybe another few years, I don't know. Dan? Talk a little bit about the mechanics surrounding the nuclear weapons in Pakistan and the likelihood that you mentioned. You know, the fear we have as Americans is that they'll get into a terrorist hands and mm -hmm. something that's appropriate. And then I know we have AQ Khan to thank for North Korea and Iran. Um, but can you talk a little bit about whether or not there really is a likelihood, or if the ISI is guarding this very carefully, or the military? Well, our best estimate is they have very elaborate controls in place. You know, in terms of where they put the warheads, in terms of who has access to them. Uh, my own personal view, there are two big concerns. One is somebody with a beard finally makes it to become chief of army staff. And, and I mean a very fundamentalist Muslim becomes chief of army staff. That's kind of a game changer. Uh, the other concern and yeah, this is, I sometimes feel embarrassed because these things never work out this way, but frankly, 
you do have more and more mid-level officers uh, who are much more fundamentalist in their views. The army has been pretty extensively Islamized in the past 20, excuse me, 30 years. And so uh, there is a possibility, I think, of some sort of clique forming that, that could present that sort of danger with uh, a weapon going astray. But it would have to be very extensive, and the military does have good internal intelligence, too. They watch their people pretty closely, but not closely enough. I mean, the military was involved, and in, military officers were involved in an assassination attempt against Musharraf. So they don't get 100%. Mm -hmm. Could you speak a little bit about the relationship between the civilian government and the ISI and the military, and perhaps give us a little bit of insight as to how things actually get done in on an international or you know level or perhaps even on an internal level of important issues, considering that the power appears to lie with the military but they have a supposedly you know, legitimate parliamentary type government. Yeah, I think uh, the civilian government learns by doing what it can and cannot do and the uh, military rolls back things that it doesn't want the civilians to be doing or just makes it so painfully clear through its actions. Uh, I don't think the civilian government exercises any control over ISI uh, and I'd be surprised if they get briefed on much of what ISI does. Uh, the military does work with the civilian government. Uh, personal relationships I can't, can't comment on, but basically yeah, it's, it's got to be kind of an uncomfortable situation for the civilians in that uh, they know that in certain areas uh, the military will seize the final say if it feels necessary. Up to that final say they get a, a reasonable amount of uh, leeway, but they got to be careful about making strong commitments. You know, it, the funny thing is it's unfortunate that... Uh, the big cuts in USA, the big betrayals have come under, uh, by and large, civilian governments have had to implement them. <laughs> and so, you know, civilian governments get tainted with that brush, too. Uh, you know. uh, it's, yeah, it, it's tough for the civilians to assert control. I will tell you an anecdote, uh, which is that, uh, you know, the officials are actually afraid of the ISI. You know, I I know Pakistani officials who, if meeting with me in official Pakistani places, won't use the three letters ISI. I know Pakistani officials who are, you know, if the uh, ISI comes to them and says, uh, your, life, your life is at threat, you better not go to such and such a place, uh, they won't go to that place. And they make it clear <laughs> that it's, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe there's a threat, but if the ISI tells us not to go there, we're not going to go there. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a system that has very different limits from ours, I guess is a, a good way of putting it. You know, uh, you know it, it, it is a pretty powerful organization. Like I said, ultimately it's responsive to the military. The big question for me is when does the military decide that this model isn't working? And, and again, if I leave you with one message, that's it. Uh, the military is not run by fools. Raheel Sharif is not a dumb guy. Musharraf wasn't a dumb guy. He realized that he could no longer <coughs> support a Taliban government inside Afghanistan. He jumped over to the other side. Raheel Sharif realized that there are bad terrorists out there, and those bad terrorists had to be uh, confronted with all the tools of the state. Uh, the question is, when will they realize that competing with a country six times bigger, 12 times wealthier than you uh, as your existential enemy, over the long run, just makes you look impotent? Uh, that's the big question, is, is when do you see those shifts begin? And it doesn't necessarily have to become come because of an epiphany, you know, uh, St. Raheel riding, riding down the road to Damascus and realizing that what we're doing is wrong, uh, it can build up from pressure internally. The military doesn't want to lose the respect of the country. If you see, if you look at the end of military regimes in Pakistan, they come when 
the military realizes that they are losing the support of the populace. Uh, Josh. Uh, sure, just to, to, to follow on this <laughs> optimistic idea oh, that, I, I would, <laughs> that there, might, there, might be, there might be some future in the military faces this break, but I, I'm a little less optimistic. In the past, when that's happened, what the military has done is to help to install a very weak civilian government and maintain power, and that seems to have worked pretty well. Musharraf, as you said, not a dumb guy at all. I think his official salary was like 18,000 rupees a year, and he retired a millionaire somehow. Right? So <laughs> there, there are deep, vested reasons why these officers are not interested in, in fundamentally changing how they do business. But I was really struck by your comment, despite all of the reasons for pessimism, your comment at the end that there are these, these changes. Pakistan is in flux, right? Um, 140 million cell phones, uh, sort of some happy changes in public sentiment suggesting dissatisfaction with the status quo. Um, and you said, you know, maybe there's a, re there's a way that the U United States can help foster that sentiment, right? Um, I, but I'm wondering if that could backfire. Because right? I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of the recent experience with the Arab Spring in which you had not identical but sort of analogous situations where you have very powerful long-standing regimes with very powerful militaries with deep vested interests in the status quo facing broad public unrest on some sort, sort of similar issues. And it, it was disastrous almost everywhere. It ended up very bad, badly for the people who were, were protesting. Um, and the perception of the United States in those places was equally bad. And there are all sorts of, of, of theories that the U.S. is actually responsible for all that's, that's happened badly in, in these places. So why would it be different in, in Pakistan? Right? If the United States, as a matter of policy, is trying to help with this sort of bottom-up, slow movement towards stronger institutions and, and more equitable civil military balance, how is it that the United States can actively do that without being accused of meddling and without being accused of destabilizing Pakistan? Yeah, I guess we're talking about slightly different things. I, I agree with you uh, that overly, visibly, and obviously trying to change the system from below would be disastrous if it could have happened, but frankly it couldn't happen. The, uh, the military and ISI would not let us in get involved in those <laughs> sorts of things, and they've made it clear. They've, they're trying to cut the space for NGOs, for example, right now. Non-governmental organizations are under pressure in Pakistan. In fact, they passed a law restricting their uh, operations. I do think when I argue for engagement, though, that we've got to do a couple things. And like I said, uh, trying to rein in the vicious propaganda and trying to figure out a way to do that more effectively is something that I would hope we could do. And the government has much less of a leg to stand on pushing back against that. Developing ties with the military, as I said, is, is very important uh, to what I think we have to do. Uh, the Pakistan military is this bizarre institution that has traditions going back to the Brits uh, and has 30 years of an attempt to Islamize it on the surface since uh, Zia came to power. And it's it's an uncomfortable mix. You know, you have folks who tip over into fundamentalism, but, you know, you still have Shia officers fairly senior in the military force. So uh, they've got to be a little careful. What I'm saying is we've got to develop ties with officers over the longer run to make them feel that they have an investment in uh, the relationship with the United States and with a Pakistan that doesn't come out that crazy from our perspective. Uh, in terms of how is Pakistan different, and now that I've an put those answers out on the table, I'm basically kind of uh, running away from your question to some degree, but uh, how is Pakistan different from the Arab Spring, and how, if there were bottom-up pressure, how would that change things? Pakistan is vastly different from the countries of the Gulf and North Africa. First, in terms of the religion. Pakistan is still well over half Barelwe. Barelwe is a Sufi-based tradition. It's not predominantly Wahhabi. It does have the largest population. Well, no, there's a couple large ones outside of Iran, but it has the largest population of Shias outside of Iran. It's got a, just as importantly, despite 
this crazy military rule. It does have a British tradition of mouthing about the rule of law and holding elections periodically and changing people who run the country periodically, frequently through coups, sometimes through elections. So I, uh, I don't think we should be fomenting rebellion in the bottom. I do think we have to tell our story as clearly as we can. I do think we need to develop and stay engaged with the institutions of power. I do think that includes civilian governments and make them, making them look like the instruments of positive change in the country rather than the, the military. I mean, 87 percent of the people in polls say that uh, the military is the most positive institution in the country. Mm. Part of that is people are afraid of ISI, but part of that is just genuine feeling that they've brought stability in on the heels of corrupt and incompetent uh, civilian governments, and of course, that's the story that the media is told to put out. Sir. Several months ago, the, uh, there was an announcement in the media that Pakistan was supporting Saudi Arabia in uh, Yemen. And I happened to go to uh, uh, a lecture given by the ambassador to Pakistan at the World Affairs Council. He categorically denied that. And I'd like if you could explain the relationship between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia and its relationship with Iran. That's a very interesting relationship because back in the 70s, uh, Pakistan was really one of the driving forces behind this Islamic IOC, Islamic Organization Conference. It's a bizarre acronym, but uh, that tried to get together the Muslim nations of the world. Uh, it adopted a very pro-Muslim uh, world policy. And of course, that's fine if you deal with people as individuals. You know, the uh, uh, Saudis got along very well with Pakistan. In fact, the Pakistanis left a division in Saudi Arabia after the uh, after the first Gulf War. Uh, they were very reluctant converts to the first Gulf War, however, because they actually had pretty good relations with Iraq, too. That, that gets into the complicated part. Iran, it's a neighbor with, traditionally with whom they've had pretty good relations. But if you, looked at, if you look at the real beginning of sectarian murder within, within Pakistan, it started in the early 80s after the Iranian mm -hmm. revolution when the Iranians funded uh, crazy Shia groups. These were the only people in Pakistan at the time who wouldn't speak to me, the extreme, extreme Shia groups. Uh, they committed a few atrocities, and basically you've had, been having sectarian, almost warfare, uh, since then. Uh, gets down to Pakistan is 10, 15 percent Shia. Uh, and that gets down to why Islam is a crazy unifying principle for the country. Nobody can agree on what Islam is, uh, who should be the final defining authority. Uh, and if you told much of the population <coughs> of Pakistan that it's going to be Wahhabi clerics in Saudi Arabia who are defining this, they'd laugh you off. So it's a... With Saudi Arabia, they have very close ties. Saudi Arabia has provided huge amounts of unquestioned funding throughout the years. Uh, I think many people fear that when and if Iran does deploy a bomb, the Saudis will try to buy a bomb mm -hmm. from Pakistan, uh, or at least buy the technology from Pakistan. Uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago the need for the United States to cultivate ties with the Pakistani military. I was wondering what was your uh, view on the best way to convert those ties in terms of influence. Because if you look at U.S. Pakistan history, there is this pattern of the United States trying to cultivate ties with the military under Ayub Khan, for example, which did not prevent, you know, uh, Ayub Khan to have a more and more aggressive anti-Indian uh, uh, perspective for the army. We saw the same with Zia in the 1980s. We saw the same with the post 9 11 revival of the US Pakistan alliance. So, uh, um, and this is, uh, this is the reason why some you know, scholars and experts have debated uh, mm -hmm. the way we should engage the Pakistan army. For example, should we apply sanctions when it does something wrong? Some people say that it would be the best way for us to preserve the leverage. 
uh, or should we, on the country, continue to provide you know, massive financial assistance and say nothing when they do things which are literally borderline because we want to give our leverage? Yeah, I would say, again, it depends on your reading of Pakistani history. I was there under Zia. We did, we could not meet with Pakistani officers. Uh, I met with them with a, at a friend's house who was a retired officer who had his drinking buddies over. But, you know, U.S. officials couldn't meet with officers below the very, very most senior levels working on specific issues. There were some Pakistanis going for training in the States, but not that many. And then in the 1990s, we did what you noted some people are arguing for, is we sanctioned the heck out of them. We stopped the F-16 sales, no more IMET, no, no, nobody going to training in the U.S. And what did we end up at, with at the end of that period? The worst possible outcome. A, an increasingly Islamized military that really had a knee-jerk distrust of America. So I, uh, you know... I do think we have to stay engaged. In terms of does that mean massive military sales, I actually think those will get cut back naturally. Uh, and I, I do think we have to question closely what makes sense for us to be doing in terms of sales. In terms of training, I think we should do, we should do as much as we can with the good faith. And frankly, right now, there are ties to uh, cut counterinsurgency training, counterterrorism training. That's crazy. Yeah, we do have a mutual interest in those areas. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, I, I hear people say that, that we haven't done it effectively in the past, and that even if we build a relationship, how does that, uh, how does that turn into leverage? Well, it takes a long time, and it takes consistency, and one thing the U.S.-Pakistan relationship has not had is consistency. Don't forget, under IU-65 war, we, we stopped military, su military supplies. Hmm? Because I use the tactics. Right, and we cut off supplies. At that point, they figured they were an ally and that we were supposed to come to their account, That's d to their defense. That's a crazy reading of the, uh, of the treaty, and it made no sense, but that, that was the view that they actually had. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, uh, can we prevent them? Can we prevent them from doing anything specific? No, we cannot. Can we, do we need to react if they do something co directly contrary to our interests? Yes, we do. At some point, does it become enough that we have to begin rolling back ties to the military? Maybe. And if so, we should do it with completely open eyes saying, okay, we are cutting ties to a country with, at that point, 250 nuclear weapons. Uh, that seems to have a goofy, unreliable leadership, and we're giving up all hopes of influencing that leadership. Have I missed anyone over there in my blind spot? Oh, go ahead. It's coming in from a sort of a layman's perspective, the thing that's, that struck me the most here is um, how the NGOs are being sort of blocked from coming in and helping and sort of developing the economy and, and kick-starting it. You know, if they had a stronger economy, they, they were, it seems like there would be less tension between them and the regional competitors. Is, is, um, is there some sort of way that the U.S. is trying to sort of get around that and maybe work with the U.N. or um, you know, just building relationships and ties? Yeah, this is unfortunately one of those bad trends when uh, bad money get, begets more bad money. I mean, uh, the Pakistanis know that the Chinese are doing something similar. That gives them some cover to do this. Uh, my guess is the security forces argue that not many of these people are out of our control. The story that a doctor working on the anti-polio campaign was the source of the information that allowed us to track down Osama bin Laden certainly doesn't help. Uh, and, you know, uh, the pressure from Islamist parties saying that these guys are agents of, of a specific anti-Muslim agenda inside the country uh, has more people listening to it than, than should be the case. So I, what can we do about it? I mean, it is one of the things we've got to raise with them. We do have some leverage. We do have to say, hey, look, you know, when you start booting out our people, this is going to be a big deal. You've got to understand that. Uh, my wife is on the board of the Asia Foundation right now, and they've been very active in Pakistan. 
Uh, they've been active in China. Uh, I forget who else is coming down with uh, similar legislation. Might even be Indonesia. But basically, they see uh, governments say, oh, you know, we don't have complete control over these guys. They're unreliable. Uh, they might do something. They might be doing something we don't like. And frankly, when you get somebody big giving you cover, it becomes a trend, not a repressive act by a specific government. Now, that's, the, that's the problem we're facing. That's not a solution. We can, and we, I assume we are raising it with the Pakistanis. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. Uh, I had another question. Maybe it's something that you addressed before my arrival. Uh, to what extent has the, um, have the elites of the Pakistan army changed their anti-terrorist rational, counter-terrorism rational, in recent years with the rise of terrorism in Pakistan? And to what extent do we see some people in the Pakistan army uh, willing to address all terrorist movements and not only the terrorist movements who have turned against Pakistan? So in other words, uh, willing to curb the activities of even the anti-Indian terrorist movement. Is there such a trend inside the Pakistan army, or is it just a lost cause? Uh, with respect to the former, the Pakistan military collectively, the pa current Pakistan military leadership, has, be, has realized that the Pakistan Taliban and other other terrorist groups aimed at overthrowing the state are a direct th threat. You've, you've seen comments where they've talked about it being the greatest security threat to, to Pakistan, uh, and they have followed through. You know, th so they're hell on wheels with respect to any terrorist group that wants to overthrow the state. If you want to kill Shias, if you want to attack India, if you want to attack Afghanistan, that's a different thing. Uh, we have seen no clear indications that anybody is going to take effective steps against LET, uh, the Afghan Taliban, or the good guys in the PAC military's views. So, no, it's they've now come into this difficult <coughs> space where they have to divide the good terrorists from the bad terrorists. That's almost impossible because these guys are extremely fluid. And, you know, if you look at trying to even put labels on who launched a, a given attack, sometimes it becomes very difficult because folks who were with one group previously are now with a different group. But that's where they are. They're trying to say, we're going to crush the anti-state actors uh, and we're going to leave the anti-India anti and anti-Afghan and anti actors as useful tools of the state that we nurture and protect. Well, thank you. I'm afraid we're out of time. Maybe, Lynn, you could talk to the ambassador afterwards. But thank you very much for an insightful talk and, and discussion. Uh, and um, I just want to alert uh, all of you to the fact that uh, ambassador, if you want to hear more from Ambassador Moriarty, he's actually given an extended interview, in fact, a couple of extended interviews with the Center for Presidential History uh, about his time uh, as NSC director and also about his time as ambassador to Nepal and Bangladesh. The catch to that, though, is it's under seal for 10 years. <laughs> but if we're all still around in 10 years, it will be on the SMU's uh, Center for Presidential History website. Uh, and so mark your calendars. <laughs> so thank you, Ambassador. The ultimate tease. <laughs> <laughs> and, and let me thank everybody here for coming out here on a rainy day. And this is about as alert and informed an audience I can remember speaking to. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you brought the sun out, though. Sun's coming it's out. out. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me dry my <laughs> shoes. <laughs> yeah, he's been sitting here in soaking socks and shoes. Yeah, I went through that six <laughs> inches of water. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I wrote a book called Mark Sun. I actually read much of it. Did you like it? I figured you did from basically what, what you said in her question regarding China. Because the impression I got He's taking the position that China will make investments, whether it's a loan or a grant, doesn't matter, just to pursue its interests. You don't see that. If that $46 billion turns into $20 billion, I'm going to be genuinely surprised. Okay. <laughs> because you've seen them in action in other ways. Well, also, you got to understand that the uh, backdrop to this is a reporter.